I'm not really talking about that much about endocrine disruptors. I'm talking about hormones today. And uh, I will be briefly talking a little uh, basics about thyroid hormone physiology for the uh, non-experts in the field and a little bit about a, a, an old model called the neonatal T4 uh, Rodin model. I'll spend a little more time talking about our model of dio 3 deficiency and transgenerational effects. And last, I will be talking briefly about making um, the genomic imprinting of dio 3 and the implications for humans and observations in humans also. So, for those of you not familiarized with higher hormones, uh, when those are uh, pleiotropic action type of hormones, when you don't have enough, uh, the hypothalamus will secrete uh, thyrotropin releasing hormone that will act on the pituitary to produce thyroid stimulating hormone, TSH. And this will stimulate the thyroid to produce the main principal hormones thyroxine in more abundance and the actual active uh, hormone triurothyronine or T3. Now when you have uh, enough thyroid hormones there's a set point by which these hormones will have a negative feedback effect on the hypothalamus and pituitary and, uh, and stop the production of, of uh, TRH and TSH and also T4 can be converted to T3 not only in peripheral tissues, but also in the pituitary and hypothalamus to have that negative feedback effect. So you have a balance of thyroid hormones in, within a narrow range all the time. So thyroid hormones, as I said, have pleiotropic effects and they're most remarkably known for their effects on growth, brain development and metabolism. So their way of action is that uh, from the circulation, they can be transported into the cells, into target cells by different, uh, a different family of transporters. Within a target cell, some, in some target cells may feature uh, some enzymatic uh, um, uh, proteins, and diiodinase one and two, that may transform the pro-hormone thyroxine into the active hormone T3. And this T3, in addition to uh, and reach the circulatory levels in the system may bind to a thyroid hormone receptor in the nucleus that act as transcription uh, factors that regulate uh, the expression of many genes and also mediate uh, that way the biological effects of thyroid hormones. Now, uh, more central to my presentation today is a possibility that both the main hormone T4 and the active hormone T3 can be transformed into inactive metabolites by yet another uh, diiodinase uh, enzyme called dio 3 that I will be talking uh, today. So if you think about what is the ontogeny of thyroid hormone levels in, uh, in a system, it is represented here as a proportion of the serum levels in the adult individual. This, this is uh, mainly for rodents. So, Typically, this is the profile of serum thyroid hormones in rodents. They are very low in early uh, in, in utero and early neonatal life, and they peak around two weeks of life to just settle on an adult level uh, later on. In humans, uh, the pattern is very similar, although in humans, the peak is more mostly after birth and in, in the first uh, few weeks or months of life. And this is consistent mostly with the uh, the the com corresponding processes in brain development in which uh, the last trimester in humans is more akin to the first two weeks of life in rodents. So it's been known that thyroid hormones are important for many developmental processes, but it hasn't been that studied. What is the uh, the what are the consequences of having too much thyroid hormone during development? So like 45 years ago, or 50 years ago even, uh, some investigator studied what they called, uh, what it was later called the neo -T4 model, or so in which they injected rats with really huge amounts of T4, 
for a few days after birth, and then they study the consequences for uh, uh, for the adult individual. And basically, what they were fi finding is that these animals have some growth retardation. So they develop some abnormal uh, uh, physiology of the thyroid axis with central hypothyroidism and a defective pituitary response to TRH. They develop small testes and also some other uh, that I haven't, I'm not mentioning today, uh, uh, path pathologies in other endocrine organs. But interestingly, this long time ago, these individuals also <laughs> make some experiment in which they actually made it this uh, NEOT4 syndrome animals with control mice and studied the next generation and then compare them with animals that uh, were controls. So, and what they found is that this first generation uh, of animals born to these males uh, or born to uh, females that were mating with these uh, exposed males, they have some abnormalities that were kind of similar to the, to the, to the fathers. Uh, both sexes exhibited delay opening and reduced weight, enlarged thyroid gland, the females increase adult body weight and decrease pituitary size. The males, they have uh, in, um, increased TSH in the stock median eminence that connects uh, in, in the hypothalamus and reduced serum uh, TSH in response to TRH. So th this happened like 50 years ago. And of course, if you read these papers, uh, uh, you, and you can see that the authors have a, a, some trouble trying to explain how this effect could happen. They studied also the second generation from a female lineage and in, in a couple of papers all that long ago, but that inspires us because of the model that we were studying that I'm gonna talk about now, uh, may have also some uh, intergenerational or transgenerational effects as a result of thyroid hormones. So if we go back to this ontology, ontogeny of thyroid hormones, uh, one of the critical questions is that despite the thyroid hormones being able to cross the placenta, the maternal, uh, the, the, the fetal level of thyroid hormones are still very low. And the main reason is that most fetal tissues and the placenta express high levels of uh, DIO3, the enzyme that breaks down thyroid hormones. So in most tissues you can see through development, uh, two uh, orders of magnitude decrease in these enzymes, suggesting that this is uh, the main uh, factor maintaining low levels of thyroid hormones in, in early development. In fact, even immediately after implantation, uh, the sidewall tissue that from the uterus that surrounds the implantation site where the embryo is located express uh, very highly levels of this enzyme, like protecting the embryo from external premature levels of thyroid hormones that may affect the normal developmental um, processes of, of the fetus. So obviously with this, we st we've been studying um, animals lacking with high deficiency in this enzyme and try to ask the question, what is, are the consequences for uh, development? So this is a summary of what happens in these animals without uh, DIO3 expression. And what is represented here is uh, relative to the normal levels in, in eutharoid animals. What, are this, what, what is the state of thyroid hormones both in the serum and in the brain of these animals? So as suspected, what you can see is that both the serum and the brain has a hyperthyroid status during development and in utero. And uh, these uh, high levels of thyroid hormones uh, suppress the axis that doesn't develop properly. And there's a brief period of time around winning in which they even are hypothyroid because the thyroid axis is not functioning. And then in adulthood, they recovered somewhat the circulate uh, the levels of thyroid hormones in the serum, but the brain, that is one of the tissues that still express uh, notable levels of the enzyme in adulthood, uh, becomes hyperthyroid again. So th these animals uh, with this exposure have many 
uh, abnormalities like growth retardation, small testes, uh, some neuroendocrine abnormalities relating to the thyroid axis, the leptin uh, system, the gonadal axis, oxytocin, and a number of abnormal behaviors related to hyperactivity, depression and anxiety, aggression, maternal behavior. So really uh, 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 brain morphology, a sensory function, really uh, a very rich phenotype and mostly affecting the brain. And I must say that if you inhibit or inactivate this enzyme in adulthood only, most of the phenotypes are gone. So there's only a minor phenotype suggesting that most of these abnormalities come from uh, are of developmental origin. And some of them are similar to those I showed you in, do, in, that, uh, in those papers of uh, the neo T4 uh, animal uh, 40 years ago. So we designed an experiment to try to see if we can observe some in, in transgenerational or intergenerational effects, if you will, using uh, these animals as a model of developmental overexposure to thyroid hormones. So we use this, uh, uh, this experimental design initially that uh, is, is, is been published now, you want to consult it in which we use litter mates that were knockouts for uh, male and female that were knockouts for the for the enzyme and as such they were overexposed to thyroid hormones during development the, the mothers the, the fathers and the mother were not exposed they were phenotypically normal so uh, we cross uh, this with wild type partners uh, in the paternal lineage to obtain animals that were genetically identical and either having a paternal grandfather that was exposed or a paternal grandmother that was exposed to thyroid hormones. So we use as a control, a little made wild type that was crossed for two generations with uh, wild type uh, partners. We also use another control in which we made it a heterozygous father with a, a, a wild type female to control for uh, any effect that heterozygous father might have. So we, uh, analyze the gene expression profile in the hypothalamus at postnatal day 15. And the, choose, uh, the choosing of this age is because a, a lot of uh, uh, neuroendocrine uh, systems in the hypothalamus are maturing at that time. And also the action of thyroid hormones in the brain is peaking. So we compare uh, the differentially expressed gene in these groups with that of the controls. And what we observed in this uh, Venn diagrams and this pie chart was that uh, we identified about a thousand plus genes differentially expressed in, in those animals with a paternal grandmother exposed and, or with a paternal grandfather exposed, but very few uh, were, uh, were identified in the group, in the control group with a heterozygous father, suggesting that most of these uh, uh, changes come from the uh, epigenetic uh, information that is abnormal and inherited from the exposed uh, 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 grandfather and from the mater in the maternal and paternal line. So um, one interesting aspect of this is that uh, this, uh, there was a, a large overlap that was very statistically significant between those differentially expressed genes in those uh, in animals with a paternal grandfather and with those in a paternal grandmother suggesting that the processes that are involved might be par partly the same. And if you take uh, and, and uh, represent the expression changes in this uh, group of genes that are common for these two type of ancestries, what you see is that they actually correlate perfectly well. Not a single gene is out of, uh, is out of uh, whack, in, if you want, in this, in this correlation. So th this, is, again, is really very highly significant and suggests that there's epigenetic changes in both in the paternal and maternal uh, uh, germline, that at least there's a common theme that are responsible for the differential uh, expression in the hypothalamus of this uh, second generation uh, animals. Um, 
this uh, changes that not only occur in the hypothalamus, but they only occur in the uh, other parts of the brain. Here is just a qPCR of some of these genes identified in the hypothalamus in a specimen containing the striatum and the hippocampus, suggesting that many genes are abnormally uh, overexpressed in these animals with a paternal grandfather that was exposed. And some of the genes include uh, uh, Relin or glial fibrillary acidic protein, urexin, for example, genes that are uh, considered candidates for neurodevelopmental disorders in humans, and also some other genes related to myelination and oligodendrocyte differentiation, like uh, myelin basic protein of uh, uh, GSN, <coughs> GSN uh, gene. So this developmental expression pattern that is abnormal was also associated in adult animals with uh, abnormalities in behavior. And this includes uh, decreased anxiety in the uh, open, in the elevated plasmase test, and also uh, increased uh, marble bearing. It was also associated with decreased levels of physical activity, both in males and females, suggesting that some of these uh, behavioral traits from the uh, exposed generation was uh, maintained in this uh, second generation uh, individuals. So thinking about uh, what epigenetic changes are transmitted or heritable, uh, heritable in, in these animals, we, and the next step we did was to uh, do a, um, a methylome analysis of the sperm of the uh, grandfathers that were knockouts and exposed to uh, thyroid hormone during development. So we identified up to 100,000 differentially methylated uh, CPG residues. And most of them, uh, the distribution of hypomethylation and hypermethylation in these residues was up about the same as, 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 as happened also with the, with the distribution in the degree of uh, methylation difference. But what we observe is that if you analyze the data respect to the distance to transcription start site between individually, uh, individual CPGs and, and rich regions that are essentially um, GPC islands, we observe that the closer they were to uh, description start site, the high degree of uh, hypomethylation. This also happened with the degree of methylation difference. The more these uh, individual CPGs and these enriched regions or GPC islands were to uh, transcription start site, the, the less methylation that was found. This is also a, a Boolean heat map representing that. These are individual top individual uh, CPGs that were differentially methylated. In, these are top uh, GPC, uh, GPC islands, in which you show that clearly there's a lot of hypomethylation in islands that are really close to promoter regions of genes. <clears throat> Analyzing uh, some of the top differentially methylated genes uh, associated with. Uh, these uh, differentially methylated CPG islands, we, we uh, took data from the ENCODE, uh, ENCODE project to analyze the, their tissue patterns of expression. And what you can see here is that most of the genes are uh, showing top expression or are highly specific to the central nervous system, both uh, in the adult and the fetal uh, brain suggesting that they might be a, they might be having a role in in brain development some of some of these genes are shown here that you might recognize some of them are being associated with uh, neurodevelopmental disorders in humans like uh, hyperactivity or autism or schizophrenia and so on so so we think that maybe uh, this uh, uh, thyroid hormone driven epigenetic changes might be uh, contributing in part to the etiology of some of these neurodevelopmental disorders. So looking back at what happens in the 
in the testes or in the germline that was exposed to thyroid hormones. So this dio 3 knockout mice have very small testes and the normal pattern of dio 3 expression is also, as I show you, uh, very high during uh, fetal and neonatal, early neonatal life and suppressed rapidly with, with age. So we wanted to know what, where this expression is and since there are no good antibodies for this enzyme, we took a genetic approach in which we use a, 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 a striate Cree uh, um, driven transient to, uh, to recombine the flux dio3 allele in a, in a conditional model of dio3 deficiency. So what we observe is that animals in which uh, have one copy of the um, gene uh, excise in spermatogonia, that is, that, that's the specificity of this transgene, have much decreased levels of uh, dio3 enzymatic activity. And it seems like dio3 is mostly located to, um, to spermatogonia, about 90% of it, suggesting that the gene is right at the, at the place in which you can control how much thyroid hormone spermatogonia of the germline is exposed to. When we did a, um, a, a RNA sequencing experiment of this neonatal uh, testes, we observed that even though the total number of genes uh, differentially expressed show a pattern of about 60 to 40 percent uh, upregulated or downregulated. <clears throat> the number of genes that show downregulation were highly uh, enriched in functions related to the nucleus, DNA binding, uh, cell cycle, and the structure of the nucleosome. Uh, farther than that, we compare this differential expression gene in the testes or in, in with uh, with cell-specific cell markers based on single-cell RNA data from, from uh, Green and, and colleagues. And what we observe is that in the overlap of these differentially expressed genes, again, uh, we see that spermatogonia show a pattern in which there's a lot of down-regulated genes, and presumably the ones associated with uh, the cell cycle and the nucleosome structure that may be affecting the epigenetic information of the, of the germ line. If you look at these neonatal testes uh, and analyze by immunostochemistry uh, cytosine methylation, you could see that this is much reduced both at, uh, after birth and also in late neonatal life compared to wild types. And some of that decrease in methylation actually uh, is happening in spermatogonia already. You can see here in the normal animal, uh, methyl cytosine signal overlaps, overlaps significantly for, with many of the, uh, um, of the spermatogonia, but that overlap doesn't happen as much uh, with the, in the D3 knockout that also have an overall decrease in, in, in methyl cytosine signaling. So this suggests that, that the dio 3 might be there uh, in the spermatogonia, so the critical place in protecting the uh, germline from uh, the effects of uh, thyroid hormone excess. Another layer of uh, interesting uh, complexity, if you want, in these experiments is that the dio 3 is also an imprinting, an imprinting gene. It's an imprinted gene and, and as such is regulated by epigenetic mechanism. This is a simple diagram of the dio DLK1 dio3 imprinted domain in which, uh, as you know, probably know from this series, imprinted genes are expressed preferentially from one of the alleles. Dio3 is preferentially expressed from the paternal allele and is regulated by methylation marks in this area of the loci. However, the, the preferential allelic expression of dio3 varies a lot with tissues. So in fetal, in the whole fetus or some fetal tissues, there's some marked preference for paternal expression. 
but the paternal allele is sufficient to normalize expression, but the maternal allele uh, is highly deficient, even though there's still some expression. But you can see that in other tissues like the adult brain or the neonatal testes, there's apparently B allelic expression, which add, adds another intriguing layer of why, why the testes, uh, and as I've shown you, the spermatogonia in particular, show B allelic expression of, of, of DIO3, and what is the mechanism underlying that. So, so we're looking into, 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 that, uh, uh, into that mechanism. Now, although the placenta is, also, is a relaxed uh, uh, tissue in terms of imprinting or monoallelic expression, both in mouse and humans, and it was, it was thought that the human DIO3 is not imprinted, but we have shown that using newborn foreskins and using a polymorphism in the uh, messenger RNA of DIO3 that, that the gene is also uh, imprinted and preferentially expressed from one allele in humans. Here you see that in the cDNA, there's a preferential expression of uh, one of the uh, nucleotides compared to the genomic uh, DNA Sanger se sequencing. So analyzing a number of uh, patients or subjects uh, with this polymorphism, we determined that essentially there's a 80% uh, expression uh, coming from the paternal allele and around 20% expression coming from the maternal allele in this newborn foreign skin, suggesting that DIO3 is expressed, is uh, imprinted gene also in humans. One last ob observation is that if DIO3 is also imprinted in humans, we have shown uh, inter intergenerational epigenetic effects by thyroid hormones. What and I want to show you now a particular remarkable work in humans showing uh, epigenetic inheritance driven by thyroid hormones. This was a study in a Azorean population carrying a, a thyroid hormone receptor beta mutation. And what happens with these individuals in, is that when they have one copy, their thyroid status is completely normal. But they have excess thyroid hormone during pregnancy because the pregnancy requires a little higher thyroid hormones and the thyroid hormone a receptor beta doesn't have proper negative feedback effect on the axis. So when these females carrying one copy of this mutation are pregnant, they develop uh, thyrotoxicosis. So this, in this study, they studied and they analyzed a particular phenotype. And what they did is treat the, the individuals, the subjects with D3, to suppress the hypothalamus and pituitary to suppress the axis, basically. And when, when the axis was suppressed, they give a single acute dose of TRH to stimulate the pituitary to produce TSH. So the typical phenotype that they observed, and this is copied from their paper, is that the individuals that were exposed to this excess of thyroid hormones, they have a uh, much more uh, higher response, a peak response to TRH compared to normal individuals. Or in other words, T3 is making a, a poor job in suppressing this stimulation in the pituitary. So, and here is the ancestry tree that they studied. What they showed is that this is the mother that was exposed and what happens is that the individuals that were exposed in utero uh, had this phenotype. But when they go into the next generation in the maternal line, then the phenotype is gone. But when they go to the next generation in the paternal lineage, the phenotype is maintained in both sexes. And again, is lost in the maternal lineage in the next generation, but it's still maintained in the paternal lineage. So, there's a two generations paternal lineage uh, maintenance of this phenotype as a result of exposure during gestation to thyroid hormones, which is considering the complications of, of studies of this kind in humans, this is quite remarkable that they will be able, they were able to do this in, in this population. So the implications for humans instead in, in terms of thyroid hormone driven epigenetic effects is that 
overexposure to thyroid hormones may, may happen in, in, uh, with, with thyroid disease. And that it may affect more than 10% uh, of the population over life. And if, if, uh, if it affects during pregnancy at a particular time of development, that may have irreversible uh, effects, they may uh, um, produce or generate epigenetic abnormalities in future generations. Also, as I showed, if dio 3 is an imprinted gene in humans, uh, these uh, imprinted genes have more finicky epigenetic regulation that uh, may be more susceptible to change because of environmental factors. And then the topic of today is the endocrine disruptors. Uh, thyroid hormones are also, uh, thyroid hormone physiology is also highly affected by endocrine disruptors because of their structure is very similar to many of these compounds, so polychlorinated or polybrominated compounds that are in our, in our environment. So, so, the, so to take home uh, points are that developmental thyroid hormone excess alters the epigenetic information of male germ lines, male, male germ cells, and with consequences for neurological phenotypes in descendants. Thyroid hormone exposure of the male germline is modulated by spermatogonial dio 3 that is an epigenetically regulated imprinted gene. And also it is important, this is in humans, that fetal thyroid hormone excess in humans cause also paternal line epigenetic inheritance of decreased pituitary sensitivity to thyroid hormones. So with that, I would like to thank uh, members of my lab and collaborators in red that are the individuals more uh, involved in the research I presented today, and also uh, the, the funding from NIH and our core facilities at our institute. So I will be happy to answer any questions. Uh, and now, thank you. Thank you very much, Arturo. Um, we do have one question in the toolbar here. It's asking how, how these differently methylated regions in sperm can be maintained throughout development. Um, to affect gene expression in somatic tissues, which I would say is a burning question in this entire field of uh, intergenerational inheritance of phenotypes. Happy to have you try to answer it, but I think it's a question a lot of people are curious about. Well, we're looking into that, and we don't have data. Uh, I don't have right now data to, to, to give a definitive answer. But one, one thing that we are looking into and may contribute to these intergenerational effects is alterations in dio 3 itself and thyroid hormone abnormalities themselves. So if that is to happen, for example, if there's epigenetic changes in the dio 3 imprinted domain that changes dio 3 expression in future generations, then that can cause alterations in thyroid hormone status in those future generations again. And those changes in thyroid hormone status can again program the sperm maybe in the same way or maybe in a different way, because what we're seeing is that some phenotypes tend to be maintained while some others are erased or reversed, and also depending on what is the, the, the lineage that we are studying. So right now, the, the hypothesis is that is T3 abnormalities in thyroid hormone themselves changing again the, uh, the sperm methylation in the in future generations. Very interesting. I look forward to, to hearing about uh, how that work all, all turns out. 